uh, to my left is Lena Srivastava, and she's the founder uh, of Creative Impact and Experience Lab, as well as the co-founder of Regarding Humanity. Um, and to her left is Danish Masood, who's the co-founder of Be Another Lab, and he also works at the UN in the Department of Political Affairs uh, in peace building in the Middle East currently. And then our uh, recent uh, panelist who just arrived is Lance Wheeler, and he's the founder of the Digital Storytelling Lab at Columbia University, the Empathy Lab, and Reboot Stories, um, amongst all sorts of other things as well. So I think, are you okay to start? Sure. I'll just move down the panel. Sure. Okay. Sure. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel and to be part of Creative Tech Week. Um, so as Heidi said, I am the founder of something called CL, the Creative Impact and Experience Lab. I, um, I come from 15 years of activism and working in international development and human rights. That's sort of the basis of the work that I do. Um, I'm a recovering attorney, so don't hold that against me. Uh, that's where I started. Um, but I sort of very quickly decided I didn't want to be an attorney and went directly into human rights and into um, development work, particularly women's economic autonomy. That's sort of the start of my sort of second career. And um, quickly learned that what was missing for me and for a number of people was the seeming together or the application of culture and storytelling in development and rights. Um, at the time that I started, it was sort of like a post, it was just right after 9-11. Um, what you would see often is sort of the Live Aid or Band Aid kind of use of, of culture kind of like let's throw a concert kind of interventions using culture for human rights and in development. But things were starting to bubble up. And the first thing, um, the first thing that I did in media was I was the executive director of something called Kids with Cameras. It was an organization that was tied to the movie Born into Brothels, which is um, the film, it was from 2004. It won the Oscar in 2005. And what it sort of showed was the, um, the use of photography and um, photography workshops for kids who were the children of sex workers in a Calcutta brothel. And so there were layers of sort of storytelling, layers of visuals. There was the film, there was the photography itself that we used, there was sort of the demonstration of um, education using culture, and so all these layers, and all of a sudden something sort of blossomed in my head, you know, to a certain extent, of how I can start using storytelling, visuals, and culture in um, development and in rights. And so a few years later, in 2008, I founded my company. Um, and I wanted to look at how you innovate uh, on rights and development using storytelling. And what is the role of transmedia storytelling? What is the role of innovations in culture on moving the needle forward on systemic change in development and rights? And so I started looking at, primarily, I, I started with transmedia storytelling. I started looking at how um, the extension of story and creating entry points into story and into action allowed us to move the needle forward with primarily with nonprofit partners. Right, so what I was looking at is a fairly traditional kind of development construct. It was you know, sort of using NGO partners to move the needle forward on particular issues, but trying to innovate on the way that we did it. And then I started looking at probably three or four years ago, looking at VR and AR. And so I'll tell you very briefly about two projects. Um, first one was um, a project called Priya Shakti. I was a producer on an augmented reality comic book, which is now a comic book series. After the 2012 bus rape in Delhi um, of a woman that was called and came to be known as Nirpai, um, there were a number of protests. The you know, sort of activism in India against gender-based violence had been going on for, for decades. But this one incident sort of inflamed the entire country. And so um, the creator of, of the project, a man named Ram Devanini, was there during the protests and sort of started thinking about how do we sort of shift the cultural frame, you, reaching out to youth, and how do we use our our tools and our skills, which was in his, his in his case was poetry, film, and then um, uh, comic books, and he decided that he wanted to add an overlay of augmented reality. This was in 2013 or 2014, and AR hadn't really, into it, to a certain extent, in terms of social change, hadn't really come into its own. It was still fairly gimmicky, and I would argue that it's still fairly gimmicky. Um, but in this case, what we wanted to do is we wanted to create an engagement uh, vehicle for youth um, 
that would allow us to embed stories of um, women who had been assaulted themselves. In India, you cannot disclose the identity, sorry, ad the identity of someone. It's against the law. And so we had these anonymous stories embedded as, as graphics, as cartoons, into the comic book itself. The comic book is available uh, online, and there was also a printed version. And there's a version in Hindi, and there's a version in English. And so the, the augmented reality portion was meant to attract people, but it was also meant to embed those stories that really couldn't necessarily be told in another way. And so that came out in 2000, I think 2014 at this point, and it sort of went around the world. It was um, a fairly successful project. And it was an interesting, um, it was an interesting use of AR to me. Um, on the VR side, I started looking at, um, I've been working on social impact strategy with VR, but there was one project that I produced called My City Istanbul, which was last year. And it was putting together Syrian kids and Turkish kids together in Istanbul, looking at how we use the sort of kids with camera style photography workshop, but then adding new technology into it. And so it, for, for community integration, which is a sort of a massive challenge in, in the refugee crisis. And so what we did is we, we took this workshop to kids, we put them together, we had three different translators, we had Arabic, Turkish, and English. And they came together, 20 kids, and sort of created their own. They created Twitter videos, they created sort of um, stills, they created graphics, and then they created a VR film by themselves, sort of all using all of those, um, those elements. So the VR in this case wasn't telling their story, it wasn't about them, it was produced by them. It was made to sort of get them to work together. And at the end of it, the two beautiful outcomes for me were that a number of the, kid, a number of the kids said, I wanna do this when I grow up. Like I want to start you know, building things in, in these technologies. But the, the big point was that they said, even, even despite the fact that they couldn't speak the same language, they were now speaking the same language. Like they could talk to each other through the mode of technology. Um, I've always been a little bit of VR skeptic, and I still am, but that particular experience was, uh, was really beautiful to me. So I'll stop there for a moment. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Danish Masood. Uh, my life consists of three main pursuits. The first is working toward my own healing, working, looking, trying to understand what my own wounds are and transforming my own wounds into insights and creating the conditions for others to be able to do that. The second is to explore where I end and where you begin, or where you end and where I begin, a kind of imminence. Certainly, you know, it's true at a quantum level. Maybe we don't really ever touch each other. But what does that mean in terms of how we are connected as a species, how we're connected across species? And what does that mean in terms of how we're going to face everything that's coming our way, from climate change to water access to human migration to artificial intelligence? And the third pursuit of my life is a playful search for beauty. And the way that I've, I've come to these things is, is you know, by virtue of my own experience. I was born in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I grew up between Riyadh and New York. I came of age after 9-11. Immediately after 9-11, I became a community organizer because I saw the rise of the security state. Uh, not, you know, biometrics, detention, interrogation, not in some faraway place, not even in Guantanamo Bay, but in Brooklyn of people that were, for the most part, innocent, mass scale deportation, all those things. In that kind of context, I became a community organizer. And what I realized I was working on as a community organizer is what is referred to as intergroup dynamics. How people see themselves as part of one group and perceive others as part of an outgroup. And how that uh, affects the way they behave toward each other, the, the kind of privileges and rights that they accord to themselves, what they perceive as their end group, the kind of privileges and rights that they accord to other groups. I started exploring that more deeply. Eventually, I got hired in this uh, uh, ridiculously named office at the UN. It was part of the Secretary General's office uh, under Kofi Annan. It was called the Alliance of Civilizations. It sounds very <laughs> space age and futuristic. Uh, but really, what it was uh, was an office uh, uh, that was set up almost like a startup inside the UN, which was very exciting and unusual. And uh, we were concerned with addressing identity-based violence, um, uh, particularly between 
uh, immigrant and non-immigrant communities uh, where, where that is an issue, and also sectarian violence. Uh, my focus was uh, both uh, immigrant, non-immigrant communities, but also sectarian violence, principally focused on uh, what are referred to as Muslim-majority countries. So a lot of North Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia to a certain extent. And uh, as part of that work, I, I, I had a tiny fund. I had a, personally had a $2.2 million fund that I was given uh, for, from which I could kind of stand, you know, launch a, a experimental projects in different parts of the world. As part of that, I, I launched projects in places like Pakistan, Egypt, Nepal, the United Kingdom, elsewhere in the United States, looking at all these things, exploring, uh, setting up sandboxes, uh, trying to create some kind of project that would bring together what I perceive to be in-groups and out-groups around some kind of shared need. In doing that work, I eventually realized that I was bending over backwards, you know, putting myself into the shape of a pretzel to try to get people to talk to each other, to be vulnerable to each other, and to really share their pain. And I also realized that a lot of times when we uh, otherize others, when we put, see someone as part of an outgroup, in a way we're projecting our own fears onto them. And the reason why I wanted people to be able to be vulnerable to one another is because when we show ourselves, when you show what our pain is, and people can recognize themselves in the pain that we're showing, we're, we both become stronger. Because it takes courage for me to show you my pain. And if you see yourself in the pain that I'm showing you, if I'm telling you a story about my mother or my father, and you look at that, and you say, I recognize my relationship with my brother or my sister in the story you're telling, suddenly both of us are a little less alone. And not only this, I, I, I began to see that in communities that have histories of violence, often that, vi that the trauma of, of that violence that has been passed down across generations lives in an embodied way. It's almost as though it exists in their bodies and how they carry themselves. So I decided to start exploring this further. I wanted to understand you know, where, what, what social psychology, what cognitive neuroscience has to say about all these things. And I started doing literature reviews. And as a, as a result of that, I came upon this experiment from neuroscience that's referred to as the body transfer illusion. What the body transfer illusion essentially is, is an exploration of how, you, how your brain comes to believe that it is in your body. And a lot of it has to do with all your senses, how your brain integrates all of your senses. Your brain takes in all these outputs from the outside world. We like to say we have five senses. In truth, we have more like 20, maybe even more. But your brain takes in all these inputs from the outside world and processes them and gives you the feeling of embodiment. And when we clarify that process, we can skew those inputs in order to give you the experience of being in someone else's body. This, I thought, was key. I thought, you know, this was my aha moment. I thought to myself, well, if we can give someone the experience of being in someone else's body from a first-person perspective, think about the, the possibilities there. Think about the potential there. And so I started going around shopping this idea around with different people, saying I wanted to put people in other people's bodies. And people told me, people ran me off and told me I was crazy, basically, right? And eventually, uh, I found another group of crazy people um, uh, to, who were uh, similarly interested in this idea, and that's how I became part of this larger collective uh, uh, that we today call Be Another Lab. And uh, essentially what we do, what we did at Be Another Lab when we came together, is we built a platform using VR, uh, telepresence, uh, clever sort of camera techniques, and performance art and storytelling to give people the experience of being in someone else's body. So you come into our lab, you put on some equipment, we put on a couple of bone transducers on you uh, for the audio part, and you open your eyes and you're in someone else's body. You get comfortable, you move around, the body moves as you expect it to move from a first person perspective, and then your brain begins to believe it's in that body. And so we started using that for, for telling stories. And you know, our, our goal in doing this was to get people to have an embodied experience, get people to touch themselves and touch each other as a way of knowing each other, but also to sort of invert the subject and object uh, experience that you normally have with documentaries, for example. 
because what more vulnerable state can you put yourself in than seeing yourself in someone else's body, right? It's kind of, you're not, you're, the gaze isn't so much on the other anymore. The gaze is on you, but you're in another body. And that's a very vulnerable experience. And because I have a limited amount of time, I'm, I'm just going to say this, that what we're doing now with this technology and with this platform is not so much um, uh, you know, going around forcing it on other people, creating content. We're not so concerned with that. What we're concerned with is prototyping approaches. So how do we go into a, a context where people don't normally use this kind of technology, where, don't, where they don't normally have exposure to this, these kinds of insights and this kind of platform, such as the jungle in France, right? Or a refugee camp for, for South Sudanese refugees in Israel. Uh, or a, a school for uh, uh, dancers who are also wheelchair users. And how do we go into that kind of context, show them the research, show them the, te the technology, and then work together to create something. We're not interested in owning things. We're not interested in, in having some kind of copyright. We like to co-create things with people with different communities. And we like to be basically put ourselves in a vulnerable position by showing up in these kinds of places and saying, look, this is, this is what we've done. This is what we've built. Do you want to work with us and make something together? And what do you think of what we've done? How would you critique it? Does it seem useful? When we went to the jungle, as an example, we were told that this is entirely useless. All I want is some food and shelter. And, and, and so what we did in the jungle when we went there is we spent two or three weeks just cooking for people, listening to them talk about their difficulties and their problems and the crazy journeys they'd been through. But what came out of that is that we did another work in London with a separate group of refugees. And it sensitized us in a particular way. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that th there's an opening there for this kind of process. And of course, I hope that as our discussion continues with Heidi, we can talk about other things, like the skin-to-skin -skin contact in storytelling, the cutaneous experience, thinking about the skin as a social organ, maybe going deeper into the subject-object inversion when it comes to documentary and storytelling. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Lance Weiler. I'm a storyteller. I've been working in, uh, I guess, storytelling for over 20 years. Was, uh, I'm a writer, director, and producer. Um, and about six years ago, I kind of found myself at Columbia University because I was doing work and they had asked me to come in and speak. I actually don't have an academic background. I have no terminal degree. I just worked as a journeyman and traveled the world um, shooting things and, and documenting things. Um, around the time that I started at Columbia University, um, the big kind of inciting incident for me, I think, was the birth of my son and um, made me start to think about the world differently. And I started to think, what would the world be, or what was it going to be like for him, for his children, and I, I felt like I needed to help in some particular way. Um, I have a love for emergent technology and uh, for collaborative practice. So at Columbia University, uh, what we have been doing with the Digital Storytelling Lab is experimenting with this idea of what does it mean to design with and for. And so a lot of the work that we do um, you know, we do work down with the Village of Arts and Humanities in Northeast Philadelphia, where we've helped to build out an international artist residency program and have done a lot with uh, building expungement clinics and helping to shift uh, certain aspects of the neighborhood towards uh, teaching hard and soft skills. Uh, we've worked a lot with emergent technologies. We have a project that we're doing right now uh, that takes, uh, we're very interested in taking literature, so we're doing, um, project that's called Frankenstein AI, which takes the work of Mary Shelley and um, uses it as a jumping off point to explore machine learning and uh, deep learning and AI. Um, and it's a co-created project uh, using some of the themes within that literature. We've done a similar approach with Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things, which has run for now almost uh, two, almost two and a half years, has about 2,600 collaborators in 60 countries. 
um, and uh, 160 some or, uh, organized, sub-organized events all over the world. All these projects are copy left and people are encouraged to take them and run with them. Uh, we build kind of creative frameworks. So with that Sherlock project in particular, what was interesting is it gave birth to an Afrofuturist writer's room in South Central Los Angeles that's working with youth there to reimagine the neighborhood. Uh, it led to the creation of an augmented reality app around food waste that took um, deductive reasoning and uh, uh, narrative deduction to look at where food comes from and how it's being wasted. It's being used to build out um, a program for the hearing impaired in Warsaw. and so. In that particular instance, we, we, we work to kind of build these creative frameworks. Um, we're currently now working on a project called the Empathy Lab, where we brought together a number of change makers working across a number of different verticals, uh, policy, technology, education, health, and uh, took them and, and thought, how can we help to uh, take the work that they're doing, the impact that they're doing, and figuring out ways that we can marry them to scale partners. So we partnered up with Refinery29, which is, reaches about 400 million um, people and that have about a $1.5 billion spending power. And we started to uh, work to activate, do these uh, kind of empathy activations in various places, um, looking at a variety of different subjects. Uh, in addition to that, we, uh, we have some frameworks that we use that we, um, we go in and we do conflict resolution and we use story as a tool, um, as a way to kind of create shared narratives. Um, I think the thing that's most fascinating to me um, and uh, as, I, as I go forward is this physicality of narrative. This idea of these emergent technologies that we're rapidly, you know, kind of they're all around us and, and I wonder and, and we try to do work in which we can empower those people who are taking part in it to hopefully help you know, humanity be able to shape the technology as opposed to technology shaping us. Um, and one project that we really embodied that in was, uh, you can find a white paper for it, it's called My Sky is Falling. Uh, you can find it at myskyisfalling.com where we worked with foster youth to build a science fiction experience that when you went through that it would help you to understand emotionally what it's like to age out of care and so people wore wearables and we worked with data scientists to come up with 26 different feedback loops within that experience so we weren't just doing things that were pre-survey and post-survey and audio video transcription that project was very transformative not only for my students but also for the foster youth who took part in it and so I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do at, at the Digital Storytelling Lab is kind of storytelling agnostic. It doesn't necessarily have to have a certain running time or a format. It's, it's more about how can we break it from being a one-to-many to a many-to-many -many kind of paradigm. So that's what we're doing. Um, so I think that one of the threads that moves across your work is co-creational processes. And I guess I'm wondering what other ingredients Right. Um, really, uh, depart from current practices using these emerging forms that really move participants uh, to act. Right. So, what are some of the ingredients we touched upon a little bit? The role that the body plays in social change processes through physical objects, um, and we've also talked a little bit about co-creational processes or methodologies or frameworks. Um, and then I would say the last piece is. Um, how do we use, employ these technologies using some of those strategies in a way that is ethical, right? What are some of the things that you're using that you think create a departure um, that doesn't fall prey to poverty, porn, or re-traumatization and these types of things? So I guess I'm really trying to get at some of the ingredients you're finding that are working together. Okay. So, um, you know, when I first started looking at transmedia storytelling back in like 2008, my ulterior motive was to make sure that there were more authors and more people telling their stories. Um, in the, in, Don, you probably know this too, in, in the development, international development world, in the rights world, often um, people from headquarters are telling stories. Like there's a communications kind of agenda where people frame stories, they'll do the video, and then they'll send it out. Um, and there is an, the object, the subject-object uh, dynamic that Donish talked about. 
And I was trying to figure out how do you get more people to take control of their own narrative. And transmedia storytelling, to me at that point, seemed a really good way to do this. The problem with sort of, and particularly with, with I, what I see with VR, is that we're sort of, there's a return to that paradigm of, of people being gazed at. Um, so you'll put on the gear, and you're all of a sudden, quote unquote, in somebody's world, but you're not really in their world, right? You can always take off the gear. You're, there's still a gaze. There's still me watching somebody else, even if I'm sort of taking it, even if I've taken on their persona, because you can always leave. Um, so what I've tried to do in using these technologies, how do, you, how do you get people to use the technology to tell their stories? Not me producing the piece, but them producing the piece and me creating the distribution um, avenues. And to me, that seems to, that, for me, that shifts the frame a little bit, uh, because with, with new, th the more immersive a technology get, the more gets, the more difficult it is to control um, the poverty porn aspect. If it's poverty porn already, it's just going to be amplified, right? What is beautiful about sort of immersive technologies is that you get this sort of immediate intimacy, you get this confrontation that is really, really beautiful. It really comes down to me to the creator's intent about how. How are you going to frame that story? How you frame the, the, the experience? Like experience design is very crucial. Like how do you design experience around the media? And then how do you do some aftercare, both of the subject and also of the user? Um, those are some of the things that I'd like to see, you know, sort of the industry talk about a little bit more. Um, and I think that, I mean, what I love about Lance's work as well is that, you know, looking at I call my work community-centered design. It's sort of a, it's, it's an offshoot of human-centered design. I think you've done this with, not for, dynamic really well. And I think that's the second, that's the second uh, piece that I think I want to see discussed a little bit more. No particular order. Oh, um, I, uh, one thing that um, has been interesting in, in terms of uh, some of the things we've taken from the collaborative side of the work is, um, and we learned this, and it's going to sound very obvious, but it was something that took a lot of time to kind of figure out. Um, it was, uh, there were four kind of design principles that emerged out of that Sherlock Holmes project. One, and we ran the prototype, you know, well over 100 times all over the world. Um, and the first was this idea of a trace. Uh, the more that somebody could see themselves in a story, the more powerful that story was. Uh, the second was this idea of granting agency. And when I say granting agency, we, we really kind of were experimenting with this idea of teams and people working individually and then working in groups. And what we saw was uh, five to six people was an optimal size. If it was too small, it would go into certain dominant personalities taking control of the situation and people just following. Mm -hmm. And if it was too large, it would slip into a consensus kind of vortex where they would just go around and around and around and never really make decisions. Um, the, uh, the thing that was interesting was, by design, we would leave moments for an individual to do something and then be able to bring that back to the group and vice versa, and that became very powerful in terms of granting agency for the participants. The third was this idea of a thematic frame. A lot of the work that we do is kind of speculative fiction, um, and using a, th a frame like, uh, a thematic frame like uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes or what we're doing with Frankenstein was very powerful. You know, it kind of took people away and we've been using those uh, speculative narratives as a way to um, allow people to kind of come in. In particular with Sherlock Holmes, it's not just about there being a murder. It's, it's kind of set as a frame, of, a crime against humanity. And so people come in and they kind of investigate that and they figure out what that crime is and, 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 and the elements that uh, led to it. Um, the fourth is probably the part that I think is most exciting is this idea of serendipity management. This idea that you leave blank space, that a lot of digital work tends to be overwrought with instruction and the fear that somebody won't be using the user interface properly or they won't engage in it in, in properly. And the power of just leaving room for people to kind of ignite their imaginations or bump into other people in unexpected ways is incredibly powerful. And so those four principles have been coming into more and more of the work that we do uh, when, it, when it involves collaborative practice. Okay. Um, for, for me, a lot of it comes down to uh, uh, starting with a, from a point of sincerity 
And the way that I define sincerity is a capacity to be surprised. Uh, in working with communities, so much of it is, is, is not about, uh, you know, is, is about taking whatever expectations I have or our team has and throwing them out of the window and just being there and showing up and seeing what they have to say and what their needs are and how we might interact with them. Um, in addition to that, another part that's important for me is how is what I'm doing uh, uh, interoperable or not interoperable with larger systems? To, ha to ask that question, where does this fit in into larger patterns that might be oppressive, uh, hegemonic, or unequal? Uh, you know, uh, with us because we started early, we were first. When we were one of some of the one of the first acts in the VR scene, uh, even before the Oculus came out. <laughs> we were using headsets from the mid '90s, which I should show you. We have a photo album of them; they're amazing. Um, but people would often say to us, oh, this, you guys have built the ultimate empathy machine. It's so wonderful. You know, you're putting yourself in the body of another person. How much more empathic can you get? And, and, and here I have to, you know, I, I kind of have almost an allergic reaction because I have to, uh, those ideas we have of what is empathy need to be critiqued, right? And we can discuss those extensively, but in brief, since we're short on, we have very little time, there, there are three main things to remember with, with a lot of these uh, sort of discussions and this broader discourse around empathy. One is that a lot of times it ignores the power differential between the person who is the empathizer and the, the object of their empathy, the person who's being empathized with. The person who ha who's the empathizer has the, uh, the, the ability to choose whether they want to empathize or not empathize. The person being empathized with is, is just there. You know, so this, this classic example of, you know, I'm, I've had a long day at work, I've, I've, I haven't, I'm not feeling particularly emotive, let me go to this performance with, you know, three Syrian refugee children. You know, the, the refugee children perform, I, I tear up a little bit, and then I, I go back to Brooklyn and have my $12 pour over, right? The, the, what's going on there? There's something problematic there, right? So that's the first problem. The second problem is that uh, there isn't really a discussion of complicity, right? So if I make a work about a Chinese factory worker in, uh, 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 you know, where, where it's the story of a Chinese factory worker, right, who's basically shaving off years of his life by using some kind of noxious chemical in order to make my phone screen nice and shiny, you know, am I complicit in any way? Because I can spend $650 or whatever the new price point is to buy that. And it's affordable for me within my monthly salary. But you know, in order to make that affordable for me within my monthly salary, who is losing years out of their lives? Right? So in whatever story I'm creating, am I complicit in any way? In whatever unequal system I'm talking about. And the third problem with a lot of conversations about empathy is that they don't understand, they don't address critically the fact that empathy is entirely co-opted by corporations and by larger systems of, of, of government, right? Uh, the, this people, you know, people say, oh, this is, this is a CEO of Pepsi or, or Coca-Cola, but we prefer to call her our storyteller in chief, right? So, so th they're being used for very specific, this kind of empathy is being used to lubricate a larger system. So how do we have criticality around that also is extremely important in any discussion of ethics around how we work with technology and, and, the, and the creation of stories using that kind of technology. Yes. Um, maybe picking up on that thread, I don't want to go into a full-on discussion about the decolonization of empathy, which I think is essential. Um, but I guess what I'm thinking about is the way in which it's been used in VR in particular and even going back to empathy games. Um, as a as a Skinner box in a way, right? So that the technology itself is causing the behavior change. Um, so if we kind of reverse that and we think about um, is technology inherently inequitable or is technology inherently racist in the way that we've been seeing a lot of articles around AI um, in particular, 
then can we say, uh, if we diversify the tech industry in terms of looking at, you know, including more pe people of color and women as designers and developers, right, can we actually start changing the grammar of the technology that we're creating? So I guess I'm wondering, um, how do you think the tools that we would start using as storytellers might change if those who are creating the tools themselves um, were in control of the design of those tools? I mean, in terms of your own work, yes. I, I, so I'll start with a little story. I'm on um, the advisory board of an organization called Tech for Good, which um, has an app called Circle of Six, which is a, a sort of a, a violence prevention app. It is for people who are primarily women and um, trans folks who are often the subject of, of, of sexual violence or personal violence. And it's um, the, the design of the app itself, the design of the technology was done with um, sexual assault survivors and with trans folks. And the way the, the app works is a, a, a direct extension of their experiences. It is a very different app than a lot of the other apps out, out, in the, out on the market because it really, it incorporates their experience. When you extend that to other kinds of apps, I mean, I think, you know, I would, when you look at some of the technology that's out there, it really doesn't speak to someone like me, right? Someone who is a woman, who is a woman of color, I'm like, this doesn't necessarily work for me. And it, aligning that with sort of the, the empathy engine talk, I mean, I, I wish we would just get do away with that phrase, um, can't automate empathy, but um, if, a lot of what passes as empathy is really, again, what I talked about, it, it's just gaze. It's just people, it's, it's you did it, you, you said it perfectly. Um, and if you had more control or ownership or authorship or you know design contribution from people who are the most affected, um, you're gonna get a very different set of tools and applications. Um, 30 to 40% of my work right now is in the context of the refugee crisis, and I see a lot of technology coming out um, over the last few years that is directly aimed at quote unquote addressing, shifting the frames on that crisis. Very little of it, of it is actually of actual utility to refugees themselves. It is caught in this vortex of you know developers and tech folks and people coming out of Silicon Valley who see this is gonna work, this is gonna shift the frame, but it's either never used by refugees or it is completely useless to refugees. So to me, like you can't, I think technology is Technology in and of itself per se may be value neutral, but the design and application of it is not, right? And to me the default is very reductive, but the way I think about it is if the technology enhances human experience, then I think it's you know a good, a qualified good. If it starts replacing human experience or it disregards human experience, then we have to take a look at it. I mean, I think that that idea of being able to design with those populations or, or, or where the need sits is really interesting. And I think also just kind of challenging the notion of what the work is really for and the purpose of the work. Um, I think what I have tasked myself with is just trying to figure out how, if we're going and doing something, how can we be teaching hard and soft skills? How can we have more, uh, you know, allow, allow the communities that we're working with to have a voice within that process, but then also looking and saying, how is that sustainable long after we leave? You know, and what does that what does that actually look like? Because I think a lot of uh, you know, in terms of VR work or or documentaries, you often find yourself wondering, was that the best use of the resources? Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. putting the money into that in order to call attention to something else. Wouldn't it be more beneficial to just invest in what? The actual issue is so. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in ways that um, you know some of the stuff that we're doing uh, in Philadelphia is uh, there's this really wonderful program that'll run for a hundred years. It's very ambitious, but it's this, these ideas of like what could a, a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred homes, a hundred families, a hundred jobs. What does that look like in that particular neighborhood, mm -hmm. and how can it have something that lives beyond just a piece or work? Um, and how can it give birth to more? So I think I'm very interested in ways that you can give that technology in a, in a way that it can, it, it can be used to be more beneficial to the communities 
Um, and I think some of that is through education. I think some of that is through the utility. Um, and, uh, you know, the, so that we're, we're, we're trying, to, trying to figure that out. I just add quickly that, you know, even outside of whatever frames or critiques I've offered earlier, there, within a separate sort of neoliberal framework, there is an argument to be made for not doing what we're currently doing. The absolute majority of humanity is not on the internet, as, you all, as all of you all know. There, there are parts of, for instance, there are parts of the UN system, such as UNICEF Innovation, which are focused on looking at the, the, the majority of humanity and, and seeing, of course, recognizing that technological platforms are not neutral at all. And not only are they not neutral, they shape behaviors in very, very specific ways. They, they're part of, in a way, they're, uh, you know, we are co-evolving with those platforms as a species. Now, the overwhelming majority, uh, uh, in some instances, instances, do not have access to a lot of those platforms. What happens when those platforms are developed indigenously in those contexts? What kind of functionality, what kind of utility do they offer? And how are they developed differently? And perhaps when they are developed in that kind of context, they might have more in common with the overwhelming majority of humanity that is in context similar to those, right? Where you don't have access necessarily. As an example, Malawi has an indigenous drone industry, which is so odd, right? <laughs> because they don't, they, it's hard to import the parts from China. The customs are too high, it's just too crazy. The logistics don't work out. So they build their own and they're using them for their own purposes. You know, what does that look like with autonomous driving vehicles? And more pertinent to our conversation, what does that look like when it comes to storytelling platforms and storytelling technologies? Um, we only have about five or so minutes, so I'm going to open the floor for a couple of questions. Can we get the, there we go, Tamiko Thiel. Yeah, this question, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the issue you said about, about gays is exactly this problem on focusing on this classic character-based form of dramatic, uh, um, of dramatic storytelling because all of these, uh, especially like the 3D, the 360 degree uh, videos, um, they put you in a, in a refugee camp and you're seeing all these people running around you and talking to you. But you're not going through that experience. Like you said, you're gazing at the other people. So the real, uh, the real power of virtual reality is not putting you in a refugee camp. It's making you go through the experience that a refugee would, would have to go through. And you know, you can do this in real life. Also, you can you can uh, have an, uh, a large installation, and the person has to like give up their passport. They're assigned an identity, and then they have to. You know, it becomes more of a game-like thing. But I think. This is really a problem that comes because the whole, you know, thousands of years of, of narrative uh, dram dramatic theory always say, you know, take a couple of characters and make their story interesting and, and then transfer your emotion to them. No, virtual reality for the first time allows uh, you, what uh, Danish has, has done. I've, I've used your system in, in Seattle um, to not be among those people, but be that person. And of course, there's all sorts of other issues, but that's one thing that VR can do that is not being used enough and will not, con uh, will not be implemented if we continue to think in this idea of, you know, let me get the poor benighted people to tell me their story. It's a different medium. Another question? for your statement, it's kind of what I'm wondering because that makes me sound very convinced that uh, what you're doing, Danish, um, is functioning for people. So I wanted to understand what you meant about prototyping approaches, what that means exactly, and where you get your data of feeling, like human feeling, to understand that. Uh, sure, absolutely. So, so as, a, as a team, we, we don't really see ourselves as purely in art collective, we're an art slash science collective. So in addition to making art, uh, co-creating performances with different communities around the world, we also engage in um, scientific research uh, through collaborations with uh, neuroscience departments and psychology departments in different universities. We have an ongoing study with Yale, 
Department of Psychology with the Max Planck Institute with the Berlin School of Mind and Brain, uh, um, kind of looking at uh, in a more of a lab setting to see how these interventions work, uh, you know, what kind of shifts they result in uh, through implicit bias tests and a bunch of other, a range of other mechanisms. Um, uh, but uh, onto your first question, uh, what, what do we mean when we say prototyping approaches? Uh, you know, really for, for us, uh, our, the fact that we exist, that we came together and we started doing work was for us a giant experiment and a kind of almost like an intervention. Um, and to see how the tech community reacts to us, how the development community reacts to us, how the scientific community reacts to us. Are the doors going to be open for us or are they going to be shut? And then most important of all, how do communities that we would like to work with, how are they going to react to us? How, how do we build trust? What worked, what didn't work? You know, where, where did we fail? Where did we basically further lubricate a sort of giant oppressive system that will lead to their interests not being honored, right? And, and we've made mistakes like that. So it's this kind of, you know, living and learning that we're doing and trying to be very honest and, and saying that publicly, you know, and putting that out there. That's kind of, you know, really what I mean when I say uh, prototyping approaches. Um, and also recognizing that there will be contexts in which we'll be, we'll be told to leave. You know, we don't want this. We don't want you, you know. So <laughs> but being open to that and embracing that also as part of our experience. I applaud your efforts at appealing and admire greatly your efforts at appealing to the angels of our better nature, but of the Tuertes, the Erdogans, the Trumps, the others, the narcissists, the psychopaths that seem who would be indifferent and that your approaches perhaps are for everyone else but them. How do you position, and I realize this is perhaps requires a much longer answer and there's only a few seconds left if someone would like to take a stab at that, addressing that. Sure, I mean, I don't necessarily think of, of dictators as my audience, honestly. Um, so what I'm, um, but, 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 the, my audience or my collaborators are the people who are in opposition to them. Um, so what, what I'm trying to do is, as a, as a single actor, um, I, I understand that my power is very minimal, right? Especially, especially as a storyteller or a creative technologist um, or someone who is a human rights act, like a self-positioned development and rights activist. Uh, my power is, 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 is meager um, and I don't command the resources or the attention that, say, an Erdogan or a Duterte or a Trump commands. But what I have is I have a community. And community, like, I really believe that, that systemic change and social change and the way we win the fight against, you know, the forces of darkness, really, is through collective action. And so it goes back to, I mean, you know, where VR for me sometimes is a very individual experience, and that's why I, I'm not often that attracted to it myself. Um, even though I've produced it, uh, I think that you know when we're the way to start thinking about bringing together people to commit to collective action is through shared and co-created narrative, and I don't mean narrative as in, in terms of propaganda. I mean what what really is our um, what is our perspective as a group who is trying to move through move towards progress and move towards um, towards a more sort of communal response to the people who want to, uh, who don't want to listen to us. And so I think narrative is a, is a huge tool and I think immersive media um, is one way to start looking at that, at that shared narrative. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else want to respond? I just want to say quickly that, you know, there, there, there are ways that those who are supporting those people and allowing them to speak on our behalf are often supporting them from a place of fear or pain or trauma. So what's going on there, right? What's going on, what needs are not being met? What kind of isolation is being faced there that 
we can, in a climate of safety, discuss in a vulnerable way so that people feel a little less alone, a little more connected. You know, all this, the only reason we're all here in this life is for connection. Really, that's what it all comes down to, right? So what, what, what is it, when do we feel alienated and isolated in, in, in such a way that we want a strong man to represent our interests? Right? When does it, when, and this is something we need to ask ourselves. And when our brothers and sisters behave in that way, how can we create safety for them? And, and what role does telling stories in a vulnerable way, uh, and what role, you know, how can these, uh, these uh, the trappings of, of, of storytelling or, or technology, how can they help us or assist us? That's what I ask myself. It's funny because I've actually been asking another question which somewhat may seem unethical, which is that how do we bring people through experiences where they can fall prey to positive disintegration, which enables a type of consciousness shift that allows the openness of vulnerability um, in a way that's safe, right? Yeah, yeah. So. I, this, is, this goes to the critique, yeah. the second critique of empathy, which is how am I complicit? You know, can we create a kind of productive discomfort in certain moments where my complicity in a particular issue becomes more clear to me and I go back and I, I need to reconstruct a certain part of myself and say, well, I've had this experience, how do I chart my path forward? I think that also has a, an important right. um, I've been given the wrap up sign, so I thought maybe I would just um, say just a few words uh, to bring some closure. Um, I guess part of the discussion made me realize we, we didn't actually get to ask the question about where is the technology going from here, you know, as we move toward, you know, past this kind of transitional form of VR and AR, and whether or not we're actually entering the subsensorial, which makes us even more vulnerable to technology. But I think the only way that we can actually um, critique or create a, a critical discourse around technology, as Carolyn Jones once said, which I think is quite effective, is that it's by taking up uh, the technologies themselves at the same rate in which they're being developed in the service of aesthetics. And I think, you know, this conference really does justice to that in terms of trying to look at different approaches to creative technology, both for social change, but also just in terms of uh, formal aesthetics. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>